All right, and we should be set. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle Matthews. I am a platinum executive with ASEA. I have been with this company now for gosh, over six years. And I had the pleasure last year of getting a, a behind the scenes tour of our production facility and getting to meet Scott Aldred, who uh, has so much insight <laughs> into how Redox is made, how we get all of our Redox products shipped across the world. And uh, he's kind of the man, <laughs> like in see the Wizard of Oz, right? He's the man behind the curtain, kind of getting it all done. And uh, I really wanted you all to be able to have access to him and to get some of the insights that I received last year and that many of you, uh, if you've ever been able to go to ASEA and tour the production facility, you've also probably met Scott. So Scott, thank you for coming on this morning and waking up to be with us. I would love if you could just share with everybody you know, a little bit of your background and what your role is with ASEA. Sure, thanks uh, for having me this morning. Um, Saturday mornings are great for me. That's that's the morning that I actually have a, a really long workout. So this works out well for me. It's not like I had to get up early or anything. Uh, Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I uh, was introduced to ASEA about nine years ago, been officially with the company just a little over eight years now. Um, great thing is it's it's very conducive to my family life i've been married 32 years my wife gloria we have four daughters um, two of those four daughters are married and we have two grandsons so we're um, we're very family friendly and uh, we love spending time together we love to travel which hasn't been uh much of availability lately i normally travel between 60 and 80 days per year um, but it's been nice to be home for an entire year. This is actually the first time in my 30 plus year uh, career in manufacturing and distribution that I haven't traveled. So oh, wow. COVID is, is definitely um, been a challenge for us, but uh, as far as things going at ASEA, we've just continued to plow through. So I'm, I'm happy to be here this morning. For those of you in the, in the Philippines, Magandang Umaga, um, that happens to be one of my uh, two other languages I speak. I do speak Tagalog. My wife was born in the Philippines. Um, so I, I have a, a lot of good friends there. And uh, my background before see, I actually, my major in college was international relations and Asian studies. So I do speak a couple of Asian languages. And um, I've been, like I said before, in manufacturing and distribution for over 30 years. And to see is the only network marketing company I've ever worked for. So I, I did convert, I guess you could say, <laughs> and um, I'm in this for the long haul. So it's, it's been a great experience. Oh, that's beautiful, Scott. We're so, so grateful to have you. You're such an asset to the organization. And I didn't know you spoke so many different languages. That's wonderful. Um, like I said at the beginning, before we started, I got to spend about six months in the Philippines and I absolutely loved it. Uh, so I'm with you and I would love to travel back and can't wait <laughs> until we're allowed to. So. I have one question for you before we dive into things. I honestly, you were the quickest person at responding to emails and I know you are juggling so many things. How in the world do you do that? I don't know. It's an obsessive compulsive. I, I, I generally um, get between two and 400 emails per day. My role at ASEA as the, as the COO is, I have four major departments that I oversee. Um, the one that's, that keeps me very, very busy is associate support. Mm. And so there, there's a lot of emails that go back and forth through that uh, department. Um, global logistics and distribution, that's also one of my departments. So that's, that's especially time consuming. We have uh, 23 points of global distribution and seven will call centers throughout the world. So that's, that in and of itself is a full-time job. Okay. Um, and then what we'll specifically talk about today is um, my role with at the Redox Center, overseeing all production, which is department number three, and then uh, development. <clears throat> and the, the development department falls under our quality assurance. And so we'll, we'll probably hit a cup on a couple of those things. But I'm just really good at, at time management. And especially if you work between 12 and 15 hours every day, um, you have some time. But... Uh, it's, it's just one of the things that I've learned over time is uh, get back to people. And I will never go more than 24 hours without getting back to somebody. So yeah. You, you're lucky. If you, if you hit me via email, that's probably the best way. Um, because you can answer emails when you're in a Zoom meeting. So. <laughs> no one can see. 
<laughs> so sometimes you turn off your screen and you work a little bit during the meeting. So, uh, <laughs> we've, we've become very uh, versed in Zoom meetings, even within the corporate office. I'm joining you this morning from my office at corporate. And we oftentimes will have Zoom meetings when we're all in the building. And a lot of that's with COVID restrictions. Um, but we do, we do work every day. Um, if we're in a meeting live together, we do wear a mask. And I'm happy to say after a year, we've not had a single COVID transmission um, either at the Redox Center or at the corporate office. So yeah, follow, cool. follow the rules and things work out pretty well. I guess it helps that we all uh, take our products as well. So that's, it does. That's that certainly helps. <laughs> so let's dive into it, Scott. I think the first question, the number one thing on everybody's mind is, okay, so you run this production facility. How is a SIA made? Yeah, that's that's probably would take the whole hour if we if we were to get into that really deeply. Um, and, and it has changed over time because as the company's grown, we've needed to produce more product. And so we look at it in a couple of different angles. Um, of course, the first thing we start with is water that comes from the city water supply. We test that on a regular basis. Um, if the city uh, here in Pleasant Grove, Utah ever wants to know what's in their water, they could probably come to us and we could tell them better than themselves. Um, so we start with water um, and that is of course tested. And then we go through a filtering process. That filtering process includes softening, which many of us have in our homes. And we're actually adding a, a, a softener grade salt to the water only to take it out again through the process of reverse osmosis. And really what that does is that takes the minerals, it takes the chlorine they put in the water, it takes, takes um, any contaminants that may or may not be in the water. Um, and we're, we're gonna filter down to about three to four parts per million of total dissolved salt. At that point, we run some tests to see where we're at, and then we're going to go through a process called deionization. Um, deionization is, is a secondary filtration process that allows us to uh, put the water, I guess the best way we would say would be in a neutral state, meaning that, that we need to control the pH, um, and we also need to take the last little bit of mineral out of the water. So I, I, I tell people that water's in, when we're finished with it, it's in a very unnatural state. Uh, we, we've stripped it down just to H2O. And there's a big reason we do that. And that reason is at that point, the water has a zero con conductivity level, meaning that it will not react with anything else. And then the one thing we put in is a very uh, fine grade of salt. So we're adding salt back to the product that salt is a USP grade, which means that it's been uh, filtered and sifted so that there's no minerals in there. Normally salt would have a lot of minerals in it, which is great for our bodies, but for our particular purpose, we need just two things, H2O and NaCl. And so um, that's all we have. And at that point, we're ready to produce a CF. And at that point we get a little uh, complicated, um, and that's really where we talk about patents, intellectual property, um, is that we go through an electrolysis process in which every single input is controlled. So we'll control time, temperature, amperage, voltage, um, and then rate of dilution. And th those things are all really important to us. Um, and then that's what gets us a CIA. So in a very simple <laughs> uh, form, that, that's what it goes through to get there. Um, and then it's tested many, many steps along the way to make sure that we can uh, control that reaction. Can you talk to us for a moment? You mentioned intellectual property patents. How does this pertain to ASEA and why is it important for our company to have these? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And, and historically, it's important to re remember that we inherited a technology. So we purchased a technology early on that had been under development for about 17 years. Um, and there was just some, some inherent problems with the technology that the company that was using it um, had got it most of the way there. And then of course our founder, Virtus Norton stepped in and purchased that technology. And from, what, from that technology, there was some established patents that were already with that. Um, so a patent is something that's normally peer, peer reviewed and then you file that. So it takes some time for them to review your patents 
And on a patent, you keep it very general. So you keep a, a wide window of the parameters uh, specifically to what we do so that no one can really figure it out. But you do publish it. Um, as we've gone through this technology, it's been 12 years now, we've actually discovered a lot of things. And so now we classify the, the enhancements or the changes or the discoveries as intellectual property. And so we no longer file those patents. And there's a very specific reason because as the technology evolves and develops, we don't, we don't wanna give anybody any hints whatsoever. And so we no longer file patents. Everything is, is classified under intellectual property. So that's, that's the difference. That's developed internally. Um, it's like the, the secret recipe for Coca-Cola. That would never be a patent because you wouldn't want anybody to ever have the ability to go through that and discover that. Um, we stay far enough ahead on the technology development that uh, we feel like that we're probably eight to 12 years ahead of anyone that's attempting to come into our space. It's exciting. It's exciting for us that are partnered with the company to know that we've got the competitive advantage for a long time. Going. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for protecting that for us. Um, so I want to go back to the facility for a moment. It's an FDA registered facility. What does that actually mean and uh, what's required for that? Yeah, so the, the correct, correct terminology would be FDA listed. Um, so what, what that means is that there's different categories when you uh, list your business with the FDA. We're specifically categorized as a facility that produces dietary supplements. And so even though we do skincare as well with our Renew products, we follow all the same guidelines as established by the FDA in the United States for the manufacture and the production of dietary supplements. And we call those good manufacturing practices. Um, this last week, we just finished an audit with the NSA, uh, or not NSA, NSF, sorry. Um, and what they are is they're an auditing body that comes in and takes those standards that are issued by the FDA, and there's 214 points of inspection. And within those 214 points are somewhere between three and eight categories in each one of those. So that's a three-day inspection process. Um, and that's what keeps us so that we can list with the FDA. The reason you do that is if the FDA comes knocking, they know that you're meeting the regulations. And we've only had one FDA level um, inspection by the FDA themselves. And that, that was our initial inspection. And that's actually through the state. And, and that comes through the Department of Agriculture and Food in the state of Utah. So we have that um, oversight on the state level, then on the federal level with the FDA. And then um, we call for an audit and that audit happens twice a year. Um, and then we just finished our, our one for this year, just finished on Thursday. So that's what, that's what it really means. It just means that the, you're following the FDA guidelines. If they're to show up, then they will inspect you according to those guidelines. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's great insight. I don't, tell me no if, if the answer is no, but are you able to share the story of when they came and looked and they mentioned how clean the facility was? Yeah, and we've had um, multiple um, inspections. When we first opened the, the uh, Redox Center, it's been almost eight years ago, uh, seven and a half years ago, the ins we had to have an inspection with the city um, that we operate in and they, because they, they want to know what the load is or what you're putting into the sewer system. And obviously what we put in there is just, um, you know, the, the water through the filtration system and uh, any trace um, amounts of Sea Redox because we actually use that in our process. And um, the, the facility is, is such a clean level that they'll inspect for bacteria and there's no traces of bacteria, which is highly unusual when you work with so much water. Um, we've actually had inspections where they've asked us if we could teach people how to be ready for FDA level inspections. And um, so a lot of times they'll, they'll come in and um, if you were just to see different sections of the building, it would look like nothing goes on there. It's, it just looks like it's been cleaned and then isolated. But then once you step in the production area and there's a lot of activity and we have trucks coming in and out and materials coming in and out, you realize that it's, it's a fully operational facility. But the level of cleanliness is um, 
amazing. And um, th that was the first comment we just had on our last audit as well, is they had never seen a facility uh, with that much production uh, to that level uh, of cleanliness. No, I think that speaks volumes about a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that, that story. Um, let's talk about this. What are some of the things that you should and shouldn't do with a SIA to prevent the degradation of the redox molecules? Because I know you guys test that to see, hey, is this okay? Is that okay? Can you speak to that for a bit? Yeah, so one of the questions we get sometimes is, is the stability of the product. And we actually test for stability internally. And we do that through what's called a stability chamber. And so what we do is we can control time, temperature, and humidity. So we duplicate uh, real world shipping conditions. Um, also, we will once, probably once a quarter, we request product back from our external uh, distribution partners so that we can retest um, to make sure that the product's remaining stable. Things you shouldn't do is leave product in sunlight, um, especially the Renew 28 because it does have a, a heat limit. So once you get a pa past about 140 degrees, you start to break down the product. Um, that's fine for a week or two, like it would be duplicated in a very hot shipping region or um, something like that. But you wouldn't wanna put it in, on the inside of your vehicle um, if you were in Arizona in the summertime and do something like that. It's a cosmetic treated as such. It's be the same thing with the Sea of Redox. You wouldn't want to store it on your window seal where um, sunlight would come into there. But as far as temperature with the CO redox, it's a very stable product. And so it can be frozen. It can be, you know, actually um, subjected to higher temperatures than Renew 28. And it stays very stable. Uh, some people like the taste of a CO redox when it's in the refrigerator. And that's fine. Once you open it, you'd want to consume the entire bottle within 30 days. But, and of course, put the cap back on. People ask me, should I put the cap back on? Yes, because you don't, you don't want something else to possibly get in with the bottle. Um, but it is actually in a, in a very stable um, state once we finish with it and ship it out. So no sunlight, no direct uh, high heat would be the, the top two. Nice, that's super insightful. So have there ever been any bad batches of ASEA? Yeah, there actually have been. Um, one in particular was when we uh, how it had a power outage. So dur during processing, of course, we're using electricity and the power went out. And so we, we can't start over when something like that happens. And so that batch was, was just uh, you know, taken offline and disposed of. We've actually addressed that by we have backup power supplies specifically uh, for the processing of a CS. So if the power was to shut off, we would still, be, uh, still have power to run um, our equipment. So that's, that's not something we have to address. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of anything else. Yeah, that would, that would be about it on that one. Okay. Now let's talk about, you mentioned the Renew 28 and our redox gel. Uh, how long did it take you guys to be able to create that? That was a, a pretty fast timeline actually for the ASEA, um, redox gel, the Renew 28. Um, it actually kind of started, we, we had done some uh, development at our lab at the Redox Center. Um, and then we had a meeting in Virtus's home where we were able to make up a very small batch and, and kind of get his input on that. And it, that was in January. And then we released the product in May. So it was a very fast timeline. The, the version that we came up with was actually the 41st version of the, the testing of the product. Um, and then over time, we've made little enhancements. Some, some of you might know the viscosity has changed a little bit. We've increased that to increase the stability of the product. Um, and then over time, we've actually increased the level of redox um, about 20% in that product. So it does change a little bit and we look for that on manufacturing enhancements and also stability enhancements on the product. Okay. But, Version 41 is what we settled on. Nice. And can you speak to the concentration of like ASEA to Renew 28, even the serum? Yeah, it's, it's not a fair comparison because when you're taking ASEA redox, that's a, something that you drink and it will, uh, you know, is very specific to your body. Um, but if we were just to measure in parts per million, the active redox 
the Renew 28 would have twice as many active redox molecules um, as the ASEA redox. And then the serum would be twice as much as the Renew 28. Um, and that's only if we're, we're, we're measuring one very specific active uh, set of redox molecules, but that's the best comparison. They're specially formulated one uh, to take orally, the other one, of course, the other two for your skin. So it's not a great comparison. It's kind of like a comparing an, uh, a steak to a piece of fish. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, they both, they both have protein, but they're, they're, they're very different. Yeah, that's fair. People ask that question all the time, though. So that's perfect perspective. Yeah, and the, and the, I guess the aside to that is, don't eat Renew Twenty Eight. It's it's not made to be eaten. Um, put it on your skin. That's what it's made for. I've had some crazy stories about that. So just because you eat it doesn't mean you get double the redox signaling molecule. <laughs> don't do that. Thank you for those wise words. <laughs> Um, another question people ask all the time about Renew is like, how come we have to shake it? And is there any way to make it so we don't have to shake it? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I appreciate that. Um, the reason we have to shake that is there's a limit to the viscosity we can get to with that product without impacting the efficacy of the product. So if we could make it thicker, that's no problem. But what we'd be doing is we'd be impacting the redox signaling of that product. And so what we need people to do is to shake it before um, you use it. Because the serum is a little bit different, we don't have that issue as far as the, um, the formulation of that. So you don't have to shake the serum. We actually have some products under development right now that are similar gel type products that, that don't require them to be shaken. But the, for what we have with the Renew 28, the balance that we're working for, yeah, you have to shake it up. Ah. Thanks for dropping that little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait to see what's coming. Um, so I guess similar question with the ASEA Redox, is there any way to get it more potent or is there discussion about that or would we want to do something like that? When we speak specifically about concentration levels, yes, we could make it in a concentrated version, but there's a reason we don't. And the reason is, is that we say it internally is the dilution is the solution, meaning that the, the product is made in a very specific way to signal pathways in your body. And so if we made it weaker, stronger, whatever, um, it may not do the same thing. The other thing is all the safety studies are done at our current um, rate or our current concentration of redox molecules. Um, more is not necessarily better. And I think that comes up a lot. It, it's just like any supplementation to your body. If you take too much protein, if you're trying to build muscle, it doesn't process in your body. If you take too much vitamin C, it just passes through your body. And so really the, the dosage amounts and the concentration amounts that we've arrived at um, are something that there's been a lot of thought process, thought process put into that. Um, and we continue to test that um, through some of our research as far as what are the ideal uh, concentration levels. And we believe we have that right now. So yes, we could make it stronger, but we don't necessarily think that would be better. Mm. Yeah, that's incredible insight. Thank you. Yeah. So people ask this too about the ASEA, like what's the pH of it and does the pH shift over time? Uh, the pH, that's actually adjusted during uh, the manufacturing process. Um, because what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to achieve a pH neutral. Um, so the, the, the shelf life and stability of um, our products, especially the ASEA Redox, is based on the pH. So we're at a pH neutral somewhere between a 7.3 and a 7.5. It stays very, very stable at, at that pH level. Um, once you reach 18 to 24 months, you're gonna drop down to probably about a seven pH, and then it just stays there almost indefinitely. But for absorption with, the, with what we're trying to achieve as far as the pathways we're trying to activate, we keep that right at about a seven, like I said, seven, seven three to about a seven five. Nice, that's interesting. It's interesting to know why as well. Yeah. yeah. So I wanna pivot for a moment. We've talked a lot about production 
So let's talk about distribution. Uh, yeah. I know that you're kind of managing all these, you said 23 different you know, warehouses and points of distribution, seven yeah. mobile centers. So what goes into deciding how much product is shipped uh, to our different facilities? How do you keep up with the demand? That's, that's actually probably the most complex piece of what I do. Um, every Tuesday we sit down and we have what's called a, de a demand forecast meeting. And this is based on demand rates of each individual product at each warehouse globally. We track those daily to see if there's, there's any spikes in demand. And what we do is we build a 12 week production schedule that gets um, updated every week based on demand. And the big factor in that is remember we're shipping internationally and international shipments take anywhere from 45 days to 90 days. And, and a lot of that COVID's caused a lot of delays with our international uh, distribution. And so we try to have a goal of between 90 and 120 days in every market, and then to have another um, 30 to 60 days of inventory in transit at all times. And so we, we are juggling an average of about 40 international shipments per week. Um, so that that's... Um, something that we work on because remember, we have to have all the components to support that. So bottles, caps, tubes, and, and some of our um, vendors have up to a six month lead time. So we're working about six months in the future and we adjust that as, as uh, demand is required. But it's probably the thing that we pay attention to the most. COVID, if you've experienced a, a back order or delay in COVID, none of it's been on the production side. All of it's been on the distribution side. We just simply have not had the availability uh, to get products shipped because of uh, so many things have gone um, to online ordering. So just a, a side note to that, in the United States, we operated at peak Christmas levels and above for the entire year. So think about how many packages are shipped between Thanksgiving and Christmas. In the U.S., uh, we were above those levels for the entire year. So you can only imagine what happened in December. And there simply were not enough trucks to move the product. Uh, we actually had days that UPS just couldn't come pick up our shipments because there was no more uh, semi trucks available to transport the product. And so, you know, from drivers and everything else. Um, and remember, we don't control that. We simply put that through the, the warehouse distribution system. But yeah, it's been a very complex piece of what we do, but every week it's reviewed. Uh, we have what's called a key, a key performance indicator that tracks our global demand, uh, right down to the individual unit, right down to the individual warehouse. Oh, that's amazing. I <laughs> I can only imagine what last year did for you all. I mean, to be operating at that level, uh, thank you for taking care of everything on the end that you could. And of course, things are sometimes out of our control. <laughs> so uh, we just have to have some grace and patience with everything with the pandemic. So a question, how come there are different labels on bottles of ASEA in different countries? Each country has a different label requirement according to their government regulations. Um, so there might be a different nutritional panel. Uh, language is a consideration. You have to have the, la the language of the country that you're um, distributing the product in. And so each, each of those have to be managed by country. So um, labels have to be controlled. That's an FDA regulation. So actually all the labels we use on the product are under lock and key. And I myself don't even have um, a key for that lock to unlock those. So we, we have to tightly monitor those because they're specific to the market. Um, and there's market requirements. We actually have in Europe. So if you're joining us from Europe, we can't say Redox. So your product just says a SIA on the label. Um, and so that, that's uh, different. There's different labels for different countries based on their regulation and their uh, requirements by their equivalent of the Food and Drug Administration. Thank you for that. I know that question gets asked often um, from people in the field. So I guess final question I have for you. Can you speak to the continued research that ASEA is doing with its products? Any, you gave us a little bit of a teaser. Any more you could give us on, you know, what we're going to see coming out of the Verticel Norton Center of Redox Life Sciences? Yeah, so if you were to, if the camera could go just outside my door, that's where the Redox uh, lab is. And it, 
what we did is we shifted some of the testing we were doing at the Redox Center to our corporate office and expanded that. And it gives us the ability to test uh, different levels of concentration, different molecules, and different products as we go through development. Um, in the last two years, there's been more breakthroughs on the technology than there was in the previous 10 years altogether. So behind the scenes, as, as you're out building your businesses and, and sharing the product, we are working frantically to develop new products. And I, I will assure you they are coming. Um, we've expanded our internal knowledge of Redox. And, and I guess I, as, if we're gonna talk about Redox, I'll, I'll give you a really simple definition that you can use. Redox is the transfer of electrons. So if somebody wants to know what is redox signaling, it's the transfer of electrons. And that's the product that we're producing. We produce a product that does that in your body. Um, the lab comes in is you have to have very specific equipment. So over the last two years, we've been able to not only test molecules in parts per million, but now to parts per billion. And to give you an idea of what a billion is, your heartbeat beats a billion times in the first 30 years of life. So we are looking for one heartbeat in 30 years. And that's the level of testing that we can do at this lab now. And by doing that, it allows us to understand the mechanism or the mode of action. And that, that's a big upgrade for what we've done historically. So new testing equipment, uh, people that are a lot smarter than myself using that equipment. Um, and that have background in genetics and chemistry and biology. And that's the charter of that lab. And so we do use it every single day for our internal testing, but it allows us as we're developing new products to look to the future. And they are coming. I mean, that's not a secret. Um, we're well on our way for developing that. Part of that is also developing new technologies within the redox space. Um, to keep us true and, and on our message that, we're, that we've been signaling to everyone for the last 12 years of redox signaling. So that's how the lab comes into play. That's so exciting. I can't wait to see. You've got me really excited. <laughs> uh, I know we're, we're kind of at the bottom of the hour. There were a couple questions in the chat. If you could take maybe one minute and I could kind of rapidly ask you these, I think many yeah. people would have this question. So one yeah. is what kind of salt is used? So the salt is a USP grade. USP stands for United States Pharmacopoeia. That just means the level of testing. That salt has to be void of any other minerals. So we, that comes with the, what's called a certi uh, certificate of analysis. And then we do our internal testing on the salt to make sure there's no other trace minerals. Um, normal salt that you would buy in the store or Himalayan salt or something like that. It's great, but it has a lot of minerals in it that for our specific purpose, we can't use. Sure. So that's a specific grade of salt that we use. Okay, and the expiration date on the product, because uh, you talked about you know 18 months out, 24 yeah. months out, where the pH is, can you drink a CA when it's past its expiration? Yeah, it wouldn't be harmful. It just doesn't have the same level of molecules. So two things that we test, we test product stability, but we also test uh, efficacy. So at 18 months, the product has to still have 80% of its original value of redox signaling molecules. And that's how we come up with that. If you've been with a CIA a long time, the original expiration on a CIA redox was 12 months, and then it was 15 months, and then it was 18 months. That's come from enhancements on the manufacturing side so that we can keep the product more stable longer. And so that, that's things that we don't, you know, that doesn't get published that, that often, or we, we don't stand up on stage at convention and talk about those things. But those are the things that are leading to breakthroughs in the technology. So yeah, it's still safe to drink. There wouldn't be any bacteria in the product, um, but it just wouldn't be as strong. So you, it would still be okay. But that's why we try to rotate all product globally in six months or less. We just want you to have the freshest, most powerful product all the time. That, that's how we come to those dates. But 18 months is what we are globally with one exception would be Taiwan. And Taiwan formula based on their regulatory is a little bit different. And so it has to have less salt. And so their, um, 
their expiration is 15 months. And we're still working on stability on that to, to boost it up to 18 months. But Interesting. That, that's, that's the goal. Okay. And there's a question, um, Edwin's asked this question, with, will the technology be protected by only producing it in Salt Lake City and not creating duplicate production sites globally? Yeah, of course Ed would ask that question. <laughs> um, we want to control the, the technology. And so we have a, we do have an internal plan to, as the company grows, to produce in other areas. But what we've discovered is we don't have to unveil the technology uh, to do that. We could actually send a, a concentrated version that could be diluted and bottled to other parts of the globe if we needed to do that. We don't necessarily have to set up the technology piece. We would just send a concentrated version of 50 gallons of ASEA and it would be diluted to 4,000 gallons and then uh, filled that way. So we will always control the technology. Um, we do have a contingency plan in place to have um, an offsite emergency production facility if there was a catastrophic failure here in Utah. Um, but we do understand the technology a lot better than we used to. Mm -hmm. And it's not uncommon. Um, we actually kind of got that from the model of Red Bull. So if you're familiar with the Red Bull energy drink, it's, they, don't, they only produce it in one place and then they send the concentrated version um, out and then it's diluted and bottled in different places. So, so that way they never have to uh, let the formula out. Oh, so smart, that. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ed, thank you for that question. Our final question, um, and then I'll let you get back to your day, Scott, is the, the empty bottles. A lot of people say, what can I do with these empty bottles? Is there a recycling program? Like, how do I, what do you suggest with these? Because each month, you know, there's four. Yeah, some people have asked, can we ship those back to you? And I say no, because it would be more expensive for you to ship them back. The great thing about the bottle is it's reusable. It's a very durable plastic, so you can reuse it at home, um, but you can um, recycle it 100%, both the bottle and the cap. So put it in your recycling bin and they can be recycled. Um, the one thing you'd wanna do is uh, cut the label off. Because of the ink that's used to print on the label, that causes the label not to be uh, able to be recycled. The material that we use for the label can be recycled, um, but once we print on it, that ink can't be recycled. So cut the label off, put it in your recycle bin, um, both the cap and the bottle, and they can be recycled. Same thing with the tubes as well. You just want to cut the, cut the end off, rinse them out, and they can also be 100% recycled. And we, we try to, there's two, two reasons why we have to use that amount of plastic. Some people ask us like, well, could you use a more earth-friendly material? One thing is we need something that doesn't react with the product. And so our blend of plastic that we use is very specific to that. And so we always go with the most uh, environmentally friendly packaging we can. So yes, 100% recyclable. Please don't send them back to me because that you're actually uh, using more fuel, sending those back and polluting the environment more than uh, just simply recycling those bottles and tubes. Thank you. Yeah. And I know they have like the perforated, you can just, the, the label rips off really easily because it's perforated. So um, I know you thought through that. So thank you so much, Scott. This was so insightful. I'm so excited. I, we had so many people join us this morning and I can't wait for this to reach everyone. Uh, appreciate you giving us your Saturday morning and you're such an asset to this organization. Uh, thank you for all the work you do and what you keep in mind there, <laughs> running everything so that life is easier for us out here and we can all continue, you know, drinking our sea and using our gel. So thank you, Scott. All right. Thanks for reaching out. Have a great uh, Saturday, everyone. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Bye, Scott. Thanks. Bye.